Welcome to the Musician's Toolbox podcast. I'm Angela. And I'm Andrew. And we're so excited that you have decided to join us for our second season of the Musician's Toolbox. Yes. Um, on this podcast, we interview musicians uh, and other professionals that can help us to be better equipped musicians in our tools and our toolbox that we need to uh, have so that we can succeed. Um, our, our podcast airs every Friday and we are always here for any type of musician, whether you're classical or jazz or pop, uh, singer, songwriter. Um, I think that these tools, you'll find them useful regardless of what genre you reside in. And um, we, it doesn't really matter how old you are. If you're, if you're a professional or if you're a student or just a, uh, someone that likes to to do music for fun. So, um, Andrew, can you tell us about our, our guest today? Yes, I will. Today, we have Dr. Josh Wright on the podcast. And I'm super excited to talk to him because I've been following some of his stuff on YouTube and he is just doing lots of good things. And if you don't know um, about Dr. Wright, he is a Billboard number one artist. So we have got some really great people here. And he performed his debut recital at Carnegie Hall and the Kennedy Center. And he earned his doc DMA from the University of Michigan and his master's and bachelor's from the University of Utah. Dr. Wright was a prize winner at the 2015 National Chopin Competition and also won the Mazurka Prize. He has recorded seven albums and he's very passionate about teaching and he's created numerous online courses to help students improve with their technique and musicality. So we are so grateful you are here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So the first question that we like to ask is, well, we like to learn a little bit more about the people that we have. Um, so will you just describe how you got into music and maybe some things that people don't know about you that you find interesting? Sure. Um, I started playing when I was four and a half. My mom taught piano in our basement and I was begging her for lessons. So we did some lessons together. She found out I had pitch, um, like people call it perfect pitch. I can't, it's not perfect. I can't say it's you know, a 440 or something, but um, I could identify those notes at that age uh, without looking. And she's like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Let's go take lessons from grandma. Um, my grandma was a great piano teacher. And so I took from her for about four or five years. Um, and when I was nine, I went to audition with uh, Dr. Susan Duhlmeyer at the University of Utah, and she completely changed my life. I got into competing. Um, piano really became my main focus in life, along with, you know, getting good grades in school. And um, I studied with her uh, through my bachelor's and master's. I did a, a little bit of private study with um, Sergei Babayan during my master's. And then I went on to the University of Michigan for my doctorate. And I still occasionally go for lessons with uh, Susan Duhlmeyer. She lives um, fairly close to where I'm at. So she's been a lifelong teacher for me and really um, very impactful. I've also done some lessons with the uh, Taubman teacher, Robert Dorso, and uh, many other wonderful pianists in master classes like Leon Fleischer and Menahem Pressler and others. So I've felt very fortunate to have um, studied with the teachers I have. Those have been one of the main um, sources of inspiration in my life and the reason, a big reason for my success. Also, my wife and daughter are extremely supportive and my wife is always the last in line for, or I mean, the first in line uh, for approval. Like she's the, the, um, the opinion I care about usually the most, because I know if she thinks it sounds good, it usually will sound good for my teachers. She's very picky, uh, which I appreciate. And, um, but she's always so kind. And um, does she play I like piano? To go yeah, she has her doctorate in piano performance. Oh, okay. Well. Got yeah. it. And then um, I like to play golf. I used to ski a lot, but um, I just don't think that risk is worth it anymore. Um, and uh, I just love making these online courses and um, helping people as much as I can through music. Great. Um, you, you mentioned a few people, and I'd like to see what your thoughts are on having like influential people in your life. Because um, I think sometimes we need to have those people around us so what have you done to, or what, what help has those people been? And 
like why should people have those musical heroes and those people that influence them i think with any endeavor you have to have a support system otherwise you'll get confused or you'll lack motivation so um with exercising my cousin helps me a lot um <clears throat> with some weight training stuff so i'll send him videos of my workouts and he'll help me critique my form um with that even though i'm not like a bodybuilder or anything mm -hmm. um with golf, I'll still go take an occasional lesson, even though I play like maybe 10 times a year, um, because the efficiency that is gained from that, I could go hit, you know, you know, 5,000 golf balls at the range and not get as much from that as I would in one hour of really quality training. So I always tell people, you need to surround yourself with the most expert people you can afford. Um, obviously, don't go into debt uh, to... <laughs> get some of this training. Um, you have to do what's best for your financial situation, but whenever possible, surround yourself. And that doesn't have to be one-on-one -on -one training either. It can be online. That's why I created my courses so that, um, you know, the stuff I've learned from my teachers, which I've been very lucky, and I know most people aren't going to be able to train with teachers like I have. At least I can share that knowledge with them either through YouTube or through my paid courses. So that's been, uh, something that I've learned in other areas, just like hobbies that I've done is even though I may not want to take, you know, full on lessons, at least I can surround myself with experts through podcasts or through YouTube videos or various forms of media. So I think it's absolutely critical for success. I think it's really admirable that you um, look for excellence in all parts of your life, like something that's just for fun to go play golf. Um, or maybe it isn't just for fun for you. I don't know. I'm assuming <laughs> it that is, it's just yeah. a pastime. Yeah. Um, uh, but you still want to have more efficiency in it. And so you still go and seek out a coach. And so I think that's a really phenomenal example of how much more important it is when you're really committed to something that really means a lot to you of, you know, finding opportunities to seek that out. Thank you. I watched one of your videos and I think this topic kind of gets avoided a lot, at least in my experience, maybe it's just because I'm younger, but, and that's making a career in music. Um, and in your video, you described how, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you can imagine yourself doing something other than music, then you should probably do that thing and not music. And it kind of sounds like dream crushing and harsh, but I mean, I think it's something that we all need to consider and not just blindly, like you said earlier, get a bunch of debt and just like, just uh, expect something to pop up maybe. I mean, um, but what would you say to someone who's thinking about going into music? And yeah. You have to be really creative and persevere. I've, I've met people far more talented than I have that have not had very successful careers in music. Um, I mean, they can play way better than I can. And, um, and I play at a high level, but I mean, these guys have won big competitions and then they just struggle to find work because they have it in their minds that they have to be a performer and that's how they have to earn their living. You have to be really flexible if you're going to be in a music career, yes, you can take the traditional path of, um, you know, doing some performances and getting a teaching position somewhere. It doesn't have to be a university. Um, and that's usually, or an accompanying job. Um, those are some very traditional ways of uh, providing a very nice living for yourself, um, teaching privately, having a private studio. So you, uh, unless you are among the most talented pianists in the world, you're, by the way, those people probably aren't listening to this. Um, <laughs> uh, it's really hard to uh, make it as a performer. And that even like Emmanuel Axe, I remember we were doing a question and answer with him at one of the schools I attended. We're like, how did you make such a successful career? He's like, I won a competition. And those days are over. Even like mm -hmm. the first prize winners have made major competitions. If they don't continue to nurture their uh, network and their connections, your career can just disintegrate pretty quickly. So I think you have to be willing to be an expert in many different fields within your field of study. So like you don't just perform, you have to be able to communicate your ideas through teaching or through accompanying 
or um, through an online endeavor or whatever it might be. So you have to continue and you have to like, I feel like the online world and especially post COVID Mm -hmm. online world is going to be just completely leveled so far as like, it's a level playing field. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyone can get their voice out there through enough perseverance so that uh, it's not just, you know, winning a major competition anymore. So staying flexible, looking for new ways to innovate are critical. I think if you're going to make a career now, having a career in music, I, I don't think you should pursue a career in music unless you absolutely can't think of anything else you'd rather do because then, because I see so often music becomes a chore and kind of like a, a job, um, which is really devastating when it's your passion. So you don't want to turn your passion into something that you grow to loathe, um, you need it to continuously stay as, as your passion. And that's a very fine balancing act. I know a lot of teachers that just teach because they can't make ends meet any other way, but they kind of hate teaching. They don't really have any motivation to practice anymore. And that's really sad. So you got to find ways to keep that fresh. I actually want to ask you a follow-up question on that. Um, how, how have you kept that from happening to yourself? Yeah. Um, and, um, I guess answer that first and then I'll ask the next part. Finding new projects that keep you motivated. So like as a pianist, finding new repertoire that keeps you motivated, like we talked about in the um, other questions, finding ways to balance your priorities, putting your most important tasks first, Mm. uh, making time for yourself, um, having a good balance outside of music, I think is very critical too, and can inspire your music. If all you do is music all day long, and I, I'm pretty close to that description, <laughs> but, um, I do have other things that keep me busy too, but, uh, those other things can bring a lot of balance into your life. That's absolutely essential because, um, no matter how good you are, if you don't have motivation, like I look at Daniel Trifonov, for instance, um, I think the greatest young pianist in the world. And uh, I remember an interview that his teacher, Sergei Babayan, who I've had the privilege of doing, you know, maybe 20 lessons with or so, um, uh, said, he's like, I hope he's not burning the candle too brightly Mm. because, um, I mean, he's released like seven albums in the last seven years or something like that. I don't know how many albums, but um, he did, you know, live at Carnegie Hall. Uh, album, which has to be the most stressful thing ever for Deutsche Grammophon, um, <clears throat> you know, a live album. And I know they can go back in and edit a few things from rehearsals, but that's like a live album. That is so much stress. So how does he keep balance? I hope he never burns out. From interviews I've seen, I don't think he will burn out. He's so passionate about it. But um, I know he's married and has a baby now. And mm. um, I think that's very good uh, for your health. Also nurturing good relationships in your life, like those family relationships or friends or other musicians um, and staying off of toxic environment, staying out of toxic environments. So for me, I don't read my YouTube comments besides within sometimes within the first 24 hours. Cause mm. I know those are like avid followers. Um, <laughs> and uh, then I just don't read comments anymore because people spew so much hate. I mean, 95% of the comments are going to be nice, but those 5% can really eat at you if you, Mm -hmm. if you're not careful. So um, I have looked for ways to de-stress. I don't answer every email anymore. Um, I had a girl email me very furious the other day. I sent you an email three months ago and Uh, how dare you not respond. And I'm just like, I'm just like, uh, I have a life. This is free (laughs) service that I'm giving, you know, out answering as many emails as I can. So you have to kind of distance yourself from toxic environments as well. So, um, when you imagined yourself as a career musician before it was your full-time career, could you have pictured what you're doing or did it kind of develop as you got into it? It's very different than I imagined. I thought that by now I would have played with like quite a few major orchestras. That hasn't (laughs) happened at all. But I also never imagined that I'd be able to make this good of a living through creative pursuits like my online courses or um, through uh, teaching or through online lessons with YouTube. I mean, I was like an early adopter of online Mm-hmm. teaching. I started it in 2012 when I moved to Michigan because I was like, I don't want to have to rebuild my entire studio. Mm-hmm. So I, um, a lot of Utah students stayed on. And then I just at the end of YouTube videos said, if you'd like to audition for online lessons, email me. So that was 
um, pretty amazing. So my career is totally different than I ever would have imagined, but I actually like it more this way. Um, it gives me a lot of privacy, which I like um, uh, to be able to teach online. You don't have a million students coming into your house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the stress of performing a new concert every other week or not a new program, but like a new concert every week or every other week, like full-time performers do. And some, a lot of people thrive on that. I don't. Um, and I've learned that about myself. I always thought I was going to be a performer first and foremost. And I think I'm more of a teacher first and foremost, who also really enjoys performing. Um, and I, I'm a pianist first and foremost, but so far as performing and teaching, I think it's a, a good balance between both that keeps me happy. If I just perform, I'm not happy. And if I just teach, I'm not happy. I have to do both. So. I like what you said about uh, keeping your different, like having different outlets besides music, because a lot of people go to music to de-stress or whatever. But when your job is music, you can't really go to, you have to do other things like golf or whatever. Um, and this kind of goes on to another topic that we wanted to talk about. Um, and it's, and you kind of allude to it, but like keeping that flame of love for music and like still loving it because when you're not really loving what you're doing, it's hard to perform well and it's hard to, to listen to, I think. Um, I can tell when a musician doesn't love what they're doing. And so, and especially now I was talking to Angela about this, how, especially during this year, like losing, she's losing lots of students and lots of other teachers are losing students. So how would you, how, um, help people by staying well-rounded and also not um, like forcing someone to do music like a young kid um, when it could help them be more diverse? Um, I think that you have to respect everyone's decisions. Uh, yeah. If they don't want to do music, forcing them is just going to make them hate it more. Mm -hmm. And um, their poor teacher is not going to enjoy it either. No. Yeah. yeah. And then that kills. <laughs> that's something. That's another reason why I think, you know, making a career in music can be difficult is if you hate all your like teaching, like the majority of your students and you just have one or two that you really enjoy teaching. Well, why don't you get a different job? and keep those other students as a side job, you know, or a different way of earning money. Um, like I've had to coach my sister with that because she has a lot of students she doesn't like and a lot of students she does like. And she recently got married and I said, you know, can you live off of the income that your husband is um, earning? She's like, oh yeah, that'd be easy. Um, they're very frugal. And um, I said, okay, so your teaching is a bonus uh, to that. And why do you have to teach these, you know, four students who are making you miserable when you have 10 that are making you really happy? Um, and she's like, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. But I don't <laughs> think people do. I think that we yeah. get in this rut of like, I just have to put up with this and you don't have yeah. to put up with bad behavior. Now, if you're building a business, a lot of times you do have to put up with stuff, but if you're established, once you're established and you can have a goal to be established by a certain date, you know, and you've got to just grind, you've got to advertise, you've got to get word of mouth. You've got to um, maybe find new creative ways of earning uh, that you may not have thought of before. Um, but keeping yourself out of activities that make you miserable is very critical to longevity. And I tell anyone who asks, I am not the best pianist around. I'm not the best teacher around. I know I'm a good pianist. I know I'm a good teacher. But I'm not the best in the world. But I'm going to outwork or out-innovate or out last <laughs> others sometimes that outlasting is kind of a depressing um, <laughs> thought but it's just like you know what i'm just gonna keep grinding yeah i may not be the best but i'm just gonna keep going and i think that's something that can be pretty rare i know like i was saying some of those musicians who are far superior than i am um give up and it's like well that's just another person that's not competing with you. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I wish they wouldn't give up because they have so much to offer. But sometimes just being the one who perseveres is the most important element, even if you're not the most talented or the most accomplished. Now, having said that, don't let that be an excuse to not hone your skills. I think a lot of people hear me say that and they'll be like, yeah, my teacher's not going to tell me that I can't play a Chopin etude after playing for three months. I was like, that's just really dumb to do that. I've had many emails saying that. I'm playing Andine after four months of study. I'm like, 
you're a moron. Like, why would you, I mean, I don't respond that way. I just usually <laughs> don't respond, but I'm like, your teacher's advice is correct. You shouldn't be playing that piece. <laughs> so, um, but having said that persevering is, is the most important element you have because look at all the people who were more talented that gave up. So, mm. yeah, I, yeah, that I think of like, some of the things that we do in getting to where we are. Like, for example, uh, like for me, I am not enjoying theory three right now, Um, but there are some things that we kind of just have to work towards and just, I mean, we're not gonna love every part of what we do. There's gonna be some things that we don't like, but there's that perseverance of just moving forward and Yeah. And that's something that you got to keep in mind. We're talking a lot about prioritizing things you enjoy. If you want to be a great musician, you have to know your theory. You have to know all of these things. And if that's a grind to get through, well, that's a sacrifice you have to make. Mm -hmm. But the end goal is doing things you enjoy and understanding music better. You'll be a better sight reader if you know your theory. It's such a weird correlation, but it is true. If you know, hey, this is an F7 chord then your mind groups those notes rather than reading four individual notes. It just makes you a better sight reader, which will make you learn repertoire faster, which will get you to the repertoire you actually want to play faster. So there's a lot of elements that you may not enjoy that have to be done to get you to the place where you can apply the 80-20 principle and pretty much just do what you enjoy. So I think you could also look for different ways to learn those skills. Like for me, um, music theory made a lot more sense when I found like a folk music outlet where I had to recognize those things in a different way than I'd ever learned them before or like sitting down and teaching myself how to play a jazz chart on piano so that I could figure out the chord progressions because it was way more fun than just going over and writing the chords out and just being like, oh my gosh. But like the, the first person that even gave me an idea to do that is I took a fiddle lesson with, uh, Uh, I can't even think of her name right now, but she won the national fiddle competition twice in, uh, that's in, in Idaho here, Weezer, Idaho. Um, So she, she's a national champion two times over her brother's a national champion three times over and just really phenomenal musicians. And I've always played with a drone for intonation. And um, she was like, why don't you get this app? It costs $4 and it has tabla and you know other ethnic kinds of drums and you can set down a beat pattern while you're droning and it'll make you feel so much more musical. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so like all of a sudden this really not great kind of drudge, drudgery part of practicing turned into this incredibly creative part of practicing um, and exercise the different muscle before I even got to repertoire. And so I was coming from the scales and tuning super jazz to go work on the hard parts of my pieces instead of like, okay, well, I checked that off. Mm-hmm. Now I can move on. <laughs> right. So yeah. That's that... great. So um, going along with also going along with the previous topic and even correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me with all the digital courses and uh, entrepreneurial stuff you do, your career is probably, changed very little during the pandemic maybe it has um but i guess has it and what would you recommend to musicians who have lost their jobs from how you set up your career sure yeah it hasn't really changed much i've just kind of rebalanced it so i teach a little less private lesson uh a fewer private lessons and I do a little more online recording. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of been a balancing shift. Um, for those teachers who had a, I don't have a ton of advice for musicians who are performers, um, who have lost performing gigs and that was their main source of income. I'm not really sure how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. Um, other than, Hey, you can charge ticket prices through a website and do live streams. Um, maybe your ticket prices are less because uh, then going to an actual concert because you're streaming from your home and make sure you have good equipment if you're going to do that. Uh, Don't charge people for really crummy audio. Um, But you can look for ways like that. Online teaching, actually, it sometimes just comes down to a teacher's selfishness of 
I have to make money from every single moment I'm teaching. If you offer a free lesson to your students, one free lesson, one free 20, 30 minute lesson, hey, I'm just gonna give you a free lesson I wanna try out online. I remember, this was 2012, a bunch of my students were like, yeah, we're not doing Skype lessons. Those sound like they'd be crap. I was like, here's the thing. We're going to, while you're still, while I'm still in Utah, I want to try one week. I won't charge you to try an online lesson. And if you get nothing from it, then great. You can, I'll give you a referral from another teacher, but if you like it. And so many of those students were like, oh my goodness, I love this. This isn't that different than a live lesson. I, yeah, but, and I mean, I've done tons of videos you can look up on um, well, not tons, but I've done quite a few on online teaching, um, like setting up like you, I don't know, you're probably listening to this on audio form, but if you're seeing the video, I've got like double camera angle so you can see my hands. Um, I've got uh, the side camera so you can see from that angle. It's not that hard to set up um, and you can do it with two iPhones, I mean, or any type of phone. Um innovating in that way is not that hard, but a lot of teachers are just like, no, I'm not going to learn the technology or no, I'm not going to let my students try out a free lesson because I need to be paid for my time. Just, you know, kind of think outside the box, give them a free lesson, help them get their microphone settings, kind of coach them. And usually those people will be um, customers for life if you really kind of nurture them along the way. Just like taking the time to respond to emails from people in my courses shows them that I actually care that, hey, I'm not just out to, you know, sell you on something and then abandon you forever. I, this is a nurturing thing. And we created a Facebook group that takes up some of my time to respond to all those comments in the Facebook group to help people in the group and create a sense of community. So, uh, you know, look for ways outside the box of just like, you come to your lesson, you pay me money, I give you a lesson, you leave. Like think of other ways to nurture them. My wife does a lot of online master classes. She doesn't get paid for those, but it helps create that sense of community in her studio. It helps her students improve, gives them performance opportunities during the pandemic. So I think, again, it goes back to what we talked about earlier about being creative and innovative. I think it's really interesting. Um, yeah, as musicians, you get kind of tied to that idea of like, this is my trade and my craft and it must equal a dollar sign on the other side. But if you think about the biggest business, at least in our country right now, Amazon, how did they start out? By not charging shipping. And they were in the hole for it mm -hmm. for quite a while, actually. And then all of a sudden everyone caught onto it. And now everyone else's business models have had to change to adapt to that. So um, taking an initial hit isn't always going to mean that you don't make more of a profit later. Um, I'm also curious to ask, this is kind of a shift, but do you, and your wife being a pianist, do you ever do any um, any of your content together? Or do you perform together? Has that yeah. been something you've been able to do? Yeah, we do duo things. She'll occasionally play a solo. She doesn't like solo performing as much. She got her uh, doctorate in piano performance because she wanted to be the best pianist she could, but she gets very stressed out with um, solo performing, performing, but she doesn't get so stressed with duo performing. So we do um, some duets and she always accompanies me on concerti that I want to play. Mm. That's really nice because you know, how many orchestras are just banging down your door, at least not mine. Um, <laughs> so to go play with them. So to be able to just explore this great repertoire that you usually need an orchestra for, I, I have my wife to play and she likes doing that. Um, it's not as stressful for her. So, um, and it's really fun for me to have her, uh, as part of, you know, that prop, that learning process. So yeah, we definitely have found ways and we did a meditation album together. We did a Christmas album together. So, um, we've done some recordings that way. So it's been really fun. That's really cool. I'm also curious because you've created all of this online content, did you use any kind of uh, like program to help you develop your curriculum mm -hmm. or did you just come up with it? I just came up with it. Really? It just, um, I started with just teaching annoying co concepts that were annoying for me to teach in every single lesson. So mm. that's how my YouTube channel started was out of frustration with my own student. <laughs> just like, I am so sick of teaching it's long, short really rhythms. smart. I love so that. <laughs> just go, just go watch brilliant. this video. I, yeah. I'll, I'll show it to him in the lesson. And then I'll say, okay, if you need to reference it or you forget, you know, go watch this video. And now my library 
is like maybe like 500 videos. It's not like millions or anything, but I have enough videos in there that have covered most of what I teach on YouTube. So people are like, why would you ever sign up for his courses? Well, I'm going to show you which method to use where in each piece. Each piece is shaped differently. Each piece is voiced differently. But to be completely transparent, pretty much everything I teach is on my YouTube channel. It's just how do you actually apply that to pieces? So that's how that started. And then people, one of my students in Nevada was like, I really want to see you take a piece from beginning to end. Mm. So that's how pro practice started. Um, Cause I wasn't going to do that on my YouTube channel. It just takes so long, takes yeah. a lot of editing, but he's like, I would pay you for it. And I was like, okay, I'll toy around with this idea. I doubt <laughs> it'll work. I'll create 20 videos. Um, so my first 20 pro practice videos I rolled out in 20 days. Like I, I mean, I recorded them over. You know, <laughs> okay, much longer. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I actually probably recorded them in 20 days and then I rolled them out in 20 days. Um, okay. so I did one wow. a day. Um, and I don't do that pace now, that <laughs> but, but for the initial launch, I was like, okay, I can do this. So, um, I just took really famous pieces like Claire de Lune, the first Chopin Ballade, um, Bach Minuet and G. So I, I did all of those very early on. And then I did a technique course and I was like, I doubt this is going to work. I was like, if I can make my car payment with these, that'll <laughs> just be icing on the cake. And then I was like, whoa, if I can make my house payment with this, this would be really cool. And then it's like, oh, this is replacing my teaching income now. So um, that was very exciting, but it just all kind of came about organically. I have, so I have two course, two, so I have Josh Wright Piano TV, which is my free YouTube stuff. And then I have two paid courses. One of them is called Pro Practice. And those are like all the technique exercises and uh, repertoire pieces beginning to end. That's my most comprehensive course. But then a lot of people were like, we want one-on-one -on -one help, not in private lessons, but in kind of like a group uh, where you can answer our questions in a weekly subscription type mm -hmm. format. So I started something called the Masterclass Series, the VIP yeah. Masterclass Series. And um, so that was kind of organic, uh, creating that as well. So uh, mostly my audience has kind of guided what I've done. What I, I, I mean, I sometimes still make judgment calls where I go against what my audience has been <laughs> requesting because I've seen time and time again, audiences don't always know what they want. So <laughs> doing some obscure piece that someone's begging you to do and one person's going to buy that video and it takes you many, many, many hours of work and you're making $9 on that video. It's probably not the best use of your time, but um, letting the audience kind of steer the direction of where the channel went, what concepts I covered, how pro practice developed, creating the Facebook group, things like that um, really uh, kind of just unfolded as the um, following grew. It's because you had free videos though. That's how people exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the other thing is like, um, my friend who's a really successful videographer, he runs full-time filmmaker, very oh, yeah. successful online course. And um, he, I was just asking him for some tips back in 2017. And I was like, so I'd probably want to give away like 20% of my content and then keep 80% for the course or something like that. He's like, it's just the opposite. You want to give away 80% of your stuff, <laughs> keep 20% of the stuff. He's like, when people have lives, when people's lives have changed because of your free content, how much more, uh, willing are they to sign up for your course? And I was like, oh, that's a good point. And it's so true. So <laughs> I just make sure to give away samples of every single pro practice video, you know, um, whether that's, you know, a fourth of the video or whatever it might be. Um, I always put free stuff out there and I also know that people can't afford it. So how much should a one hour tutorial be priced at? I have no idea, but I said, I want to keep it well, at least for the time being, and it's been this way for many years, I want to keep it under $10, you know, because I know there's a lot of people in third world countries that can't afford that, um, you know, to be paying 20 or $30 for a tutorial. And so by keeping it accessible, keeping a ton of free content that keeps people busy if they can't afford the course mm -hmm. or they just don't want it, or they're just doing this, you know, kind of dabbling, well, that's fine too. I'm glad the content can help them, even if they're not a paying customer. I don't care that everyone isn't paying me for content. I, I get a lot of joy out of free users as much as, you know, paid users. So um, I think that's something important to remember too. Not every endeavor you do has to be earning money. Um, just creating value in people's lives is what every endeavor you should be doing needs to accomplish. So that's a very big mental shift that's taken many years to understand. But the more you understand it, the more you give 
um, the more people will be willing to listen to you. And then when you do have a product that you want to offer, well, they're probably going to be more willing to purchase that from you because you've helped them so much in their lives. And this isn't a manipulation game either. Like I was saying, I'm not saying I'm putting out this free content so you buy my stuff. I'm putting out the free content to help as many people as possible. And then for those who want more, I've also created some courses. And that, like, uh, so the other way is the scarcity mentality, that kind mm -hmm. of giving mentality. It's just a more fun and enjoyable way to live as well, rather than saying, oh, this person has more than I do. So I kind of went off on a rant there. <laughs> but um, I think these are important things for musicians to consider because we come from such a traditional conservative background that's kind of baked into uh, mm -hmm. our mentalities growing up as musicians. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of musicians have that scarcity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. people told me, do not go into music unless you want to be a teacher because there's no other way to make money. And so uh, for many years in my life, my life was just proving that I could make money as a musician, not teaching. Uh -huh. And that didn't necessarily turn out to be what I wanted to do either. You know, it didn't look like what I wanted it to look like, but right but I'd proved them wrong. <laughs> you know? So, um, so it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's interesting. The, the whole, the whole, the whole, uh, genesis of your, of your particular, uh, program, um, and how you've done it. Yeah. I also think it's interesting how you kept on, like you, you got frustrated and then you changed it and you did something, um, better. And that ultimately is kind of is what started your business. But like, did you ever um, like pay for any, or did you any do any courses or whatever on like how to edit videos or how to do online courses or things, or did you just just do it, uh, just figure it out yourself? So I looked up a lot of online tutorials, like how to um, do multiple camera angles in Adobe Premiere. Mm -hmm. um, and then my friend's course, the full-time filmmaker, I grew up with him. My brother played soccer with him. Um, but I, uh, I'm enrolled in his course and that's brilliant. And then he came out with a course after me and two other content creators probably bugged him to death of asking <laughs> him a million questions. He's like, I'm going to create a course on how to create courses. If that doesn't sound <laughs> like a total scam, but he's such a brilliant course creator that we all want to know what he's doing. And he created something called course creator pro which I signed up for like the day it was launched, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm not gonna, I know you probably made this course for me, but I'm paying you for it because I believe in what you guys do so much. Mm -hmm. And that totally helped. So creating an online course, that's been the best resource for, um, you know, how to make a logo, how to, how to launch things on Teachable, which is the course um, site that I host on, how to create email campaigns in MailChimp, how to, do Facebook ads, how to do YouTube ads. And I don't like doing all that administrative work, but it's part of, you know, running a successful business. So I've had to learn a lot of those. And I've some, I hired some employees about a year ago, just like two or three people that I just um, have do tasks for me that uh, I don't like doing. And they're really good at it. They're probably better at the tasks than I am at this point. Um, but I still know how to do everything. And that's important too. You don't want to just hire someone to do your Facebook ads and have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. You might be throwing a bunch of money away. You need to know how to do everything. But then you can outsource once you know how to do it um, and or train someone else on how to do it. Mm. Cool. It's interesting how it's not something that you learned from your music degree. It's something that you learned after you got your degree. Yeah, I... <laughs> I, th I, I mean, I don't regret getting my music degrees whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The private lessons were the most valuable. Theory and history classes were great too. Mm -hmm. But um, our school system is just <laughs> an absolute joke so far as uh, mm -hmm. setting people up with successful online or successful careers as musicians. It's mm -hmm. very successful at teaching people how to play better yeah. and to be better musicians. But it teaches uh, like this career development class that we took. It's just like, oh, brother, we're, we're learning how to write grants. That's good for a university professor to know how to do mm -hmm. or a university student. How mm -hmm. many times have I written a grant? Zero, you know, outside <laughs> of the university. You know, I, I mean, I guess you could write grants uh, uh, if you're a private, you know, go-getter and you want to apply for, you know, some government money or different uh, scholarship opportunities or something like that. But it's not something you're doing every single day. And that was like a main focus of that class is how to write a successful grant or how to put together a press kit. Press kits are kind of 
like gone now. It's like, go to my website. You know, my <laughs> website is my press kit. Mm -hmm. It has all my information there. It has recordings there. So learning how to build a website is a lot more valuable than putting together this physical press kit. So I think the school system's outdated. Everybody knows that. Um, but they don't do a lot to change it. So um, <laughs> that's something that I think you got to kind of just figure out on your own. And those resources mm -hmm. I just barely talked about really helped me with that. That's great. I'm so glad you mentioned them. Yeah. I think that's going to be really useful to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. We want to be respectful of your time. So there's two more questions that we have to finish off. Um, one of them is, what would you consider to be your greatest achievement or accomplishment? Probably marrying my wife. <laughs> um, yeah, she's awesome. uh, she's like the best decision I've had, and and raising my daughter. Um, uh, sorry, that didn't make sense. Marrying my wife was the best decision I ever made, and then raising my daughter brings me a lot more joy than even piano does. Um, yeah, I don't know what the greatest accomplishment is. It's probably my like so far as the career. Um, it's probably, you know, studying with the teachers I did, they completely mm. changed my life. And so far as what I've output, it's probably not, well, a hundred percent. It's not performing at Carnegie Hall or putting <laughs> out these albums or whatever. It's probably just the YouTube channel and the online courses because that's been able to help a lot of people. Um, it's hard to gauge what an accomplishment is. It is, a, is it an amount of money that you make? Is it <laughs> an amount of views that you make? Not really. It's like how much value you've actually added to someone's life. So I'd probably say the online courses from a career perspective are my greatest mm -hmm. accomplishment or achievement. So because of the difference that you made on people's lives. Yeah. And it's also stimulated me a lot as a musician to learn new things. I learned so much from my students and mm -hmm. um, from people online. I mean, there's so many people who watch my channel that know more about many <laughs> concepts than I do. And they'll send me an email like, have you considered doing this? I was like, oh, I never considered doing that. Um, so that's been a that's great. big blessing. That's really cool. And finally, what are some, it might be just a restatement of what you've already said, but what are some tips or tools that you would have musicians put in their toolbox? Yeah. Just, uh, going back to thinking creatively, um, you can look, I have some YouTube videos on like, uh, becoming a successful, um, musician or, uh, building your business with some like practical tips, but I would say putting out as much quality content as you can and continuing to develop, to develop as an artist is the most important thing. Cause if you're not developing your content's not going to be that great, but if you're not putting out content and you're just developing as an artist, um, you're not making any sort of impact besides personal fulfillment, which is the most important thing. But if you're not actually helping the lives of others, man, it's really hard to make any sort of living as a musician. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Yes. We've you're welcome. Enjoyed what you've had yeah. To say. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Hey guys, before we roll into the outro, I just have a quick announcement. Josh is offering 20% off all of his digital courses to our listeners. So if you'd like to check out some of the things he's doing, you can get 20% off. The code is podcast and there are links in the description down below to learn more. Thanks for listening, guys. We hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, we're fairly new, so we'd appreciate it if you shared it with all of your friends. And you can find us on all the podcasting platforms you listen to. And we're also on YouTube. So thanks for watching. Is there an episode that you would like us to cover or a topic that we haven't yet? If you have one, feel free to contact us through our website, which is the Musician's Toolbox Podcast.com, or you can email us at the Musician's Podcast, the Musician's <laughs> Toolbox Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, and we also, for those of you who are watching our YouTube channel, know, but we've got some amazing merch that we're not wearing right now, but it looks really sick. So we appreciate you checking that out on our website um, and also anywhere else. Find links. You could probably find a picture or two of it also on our social media accounts. Oh, um, yeah. And you can also find information about the next person that we're going to be presenting to you. Yeah. So we are on Instagram and Facebook, Facebook, and you can find us at Musicians Toolbox. Perfect. Thanks for listening. See you later. Bye.